In this video, we'll review a study conducted by Derwand, Skoltz, and Zelenko on COVID-19 outpatients. In particular, we'll discuss opposition by authorities to the use of the study's treatment. That would be a combination of low dosage hydroxychloroquine, called HCQ, a zinc dietary supplement, and an anti-inflammatory drug, usually azithromycin. The treatment, administered during the initial stage of the disease, has been dubbed the triple therapy. The study's stated design is retrospective. In other words, it reports on events that have already occurred in a day-to-day -day medical practice setting. The method protocol is not that of a controlled, randomized clinical trial necessary for FDA approval. In such a trial, a manufacturer would divide a sample from the infected population into two groups. Patients in each group would receive the drug in question or a placebo. Neither the patient nor the trial staff would know which. In the absence of FDA approval, frontline doctors who judge, based on a growing body of evidence, that the treatment would likely benefit a patient have been restricted from prescribing the triple therapy. In justifying such restrictions, authorities cite the problem of selection bias. We'll examine this problem in the light of details from the Zelenko study. In a general outpatient setting, 141 confirmed COVID-19 patients were treated with the triple therapy. The patient selection details and results are summarized in the abstract. We'll look more closely at the patient selection data in a few moments, but for now, let's place the overall results in a table. The study compares the triple therapy results with those of a reference group. The reference group results were obtained from similar medical practices in the same upstate New York community. Those practices reported the results from 377 confirmed COVID patients, none of whom received HCQ. Four out of the 141 triple therapy patients needed hospitalization, while 58 of the 377 untreated patients of the reference group required hospitalization. One of the 141 patients died, while 13 of the 377 reference patients died. We ask, what is the probability, called a p-value, that the observed effect, 4 out of 141 hospitalizations versus 58 out of 377, could have occurred by mere chance. For now, we'll assume that the two groups, although not randomized and divided as they would be in a clinical trial, are nonetheless truly representative of the same population. That assumption, of course, is critical to our assessment of selection bias. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But first, let's do the basic statistics. In Jupyter Notebook, import the stats model from Python's SciPy library. Then, invoke the Fisher exact function passing it the results, 4 and 58 hospitalizations in 144 and 377 patients respectively, and ask for the p-value. The value is 9 in 10,000, or a little less than 1 in 1,000. This is considered a low value. So, assuming, again, that the reference group is otherwise comparable to the triple therapy group, we may conclude that the effect is significant. 
In statistical terms, the low p-value allows us to reject the hypothesis that the observed difference in the hospitalization rate is due to chance. This would be the so-called null hypothesis. And our goal would be, indeed, to reject it at a stated level of confidence based on robust reasoning. Now perform the same calculation on the observed deaths in the two groups. Contrary to hospitalizations, the p-value, 13%, for deaths is not very small. Therefore, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. The lower death rate of triple therapy patients could have been simply due to chance. Returning to the issue of potential selection bias, let's examine additional details that could mitigate that problem. The reference group consisted of 377 positively tested COVID-19 patients from other medical practices in the same upstate New York population. However, no medical or demographic information on the reference patients is available. That is, no data refutes a claim that the reference patients may have been older and sicker, thereby making the comparison unfair. Anticipating such an objection, the study included patients based on high risk Although 372 patients tested positively for COVID-19, only 141 met the minimum risk selection criteria, which were Group A, greater than 60 years of age, with or without symptoms, Group B, less than or equal to 60, but showing shortness of breath, or SOB, and group C, less than or equal to 60, with at least one of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, history of stroke, history of deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, other lung disease, kidney disease, liver disease, autoimmune disease, or history of cancer. Pregnant women, if any, were to be included in this group. While clinical details about the reference group are unknown, its risk was obviously lower because it contained both low and high risk patients. Thus, the study's conclusion, a simple to perform outpatient risk stratification, as shown here, allows rapid treatment decisions and treatment with the triple therapy, zinc, low dose HCQ, and azithromycin, and may prevent a large number of hospitalizations, and probably deaths during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is a reasonable one since the selection was biased so as to tip the scales in an opposite way. Now let's look at other well-documented and peer-reviewed studies from around the world. On August 10th, the FDA denied the urgent request for emergency approval of COVID-19 outpatient preventive and early treatment use of hydroxychloroquine filed July 1st by Dr. John McKinnon's team at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Dr. McKinnon's clinical trial found an impressive 51% reduction in deaths if HCQ was begun within 24 hours of admission to the hospital. On May 27th, Dr. Harvey Risch, Yale epidemiologist, projected that widespread early treatment for COVID-19 with HCQ 
could have saved 100,000 American lives. This message, or it's countering it with a false message. And I'm not an expert in the reasons why that's happening other than just observing it. But I am an expert in the science, and I can tell you the science is all one-sided. In fact, the science is so one-sided in supporting this result that it's stronger than anything else I've ever studied in my entire career. The evidence in favor of hydroxychloroquine benefit in high-risk patients treated early as outpatients is stronger than anything else I've ever studied. So scientifically, there's no question whatsoever. This graph, updated continuously on c19study.com, summarizes 70 studies, 42 of which were peer-reviewed. It shows a 78% lower death rate in countries encouraging the early use of HCQ. Dr. Elizabeth Lee Vliet, in an August 18th article, makes the argument that the FDA's denial of early use authorization for outpatient COVID-19 use based on inpatient data from critically ill patients perpetuates a false narrative. The FDA position ignores established facts of effectiveness and lack of harm for outpatients in more than 50 recent studies. I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching.